And okay, so um, let me just share a screen for a moment. This one. Um, okay, so this is another um, recorded um, lecture seminar conversation with a guest speaker for the module uh, Body Image. Um, and today I have asked um, my uh, distant colleague, um, Professor Samuel Chambers from Johns Hopkins University to join us. This is his, um, this is his work page. Now Sam is a very interdisciplinary. His first book was called Untimely Politics. Then he's written books about Judith Butler uh, and political theory. He's written on the queer politics of television. The Lessons of Ranciere, which is, which is the primary reason that I um, invited him today. And then a book called um, Bearing Society in Mind, Theories of Politics uh, and of the Social Formation. It would be great if that was the social body uh, for this module. Mm -hmm. And then most recently he's written, There's No Such Thing as the Economy, Essays on, um, on, sorry, on Capitalist Value. Okay, I'll stop the share now and say, hello, Sam, how are you doing? Hi Paul, thanks for uh, thanks for having me here. We're all distant colleagues now, right? So we're as, we're as close as anyone. <laughs> yes, yeah, so space has been has been deconstructed. Um, so the the module, um, as you may be aware, is called body slash image, and that relation it implies kind of you know the the mediated relationship that we have to our bodies. Um, so we've we've looked at a lot of um, kind of. Uh, Lacanian inspired theory about the, the, the kind of the, the mirror stage. We've looked at people like Laura Mulvey. We've talked about performativity and the way in which we perform kind of norms and ideals. You know, we try to, we try to live up to these things. But I, I, um, I gave at least one lecture in which um, it was a lecture that was kind of about class, classification. It's called Classing the Body. And as a way of talking about, so not, not you know, those sort of racial classifications, ethnic classifications, gender, educational, all these different kinds of classifications that we use. And in a way to talk about that, um, I talked a, a bit about the work of Jacques Ranciere and Ranciere's notion, which I picked up on his book, Disagreement, in which he talked about a lot of political philosophy or a lot of philosophy, a lot of philosophers having what he called um, a, a kind of a geometrical model of society, hierarchical, often a pyramidal structure in which everyone is held to be in their proper place. You know, we assume people are in their proper place. And Ranciere kind of challenges that with the notion of, of equality and the claim to equality. So I just, I think that this is quite slippery this, this is quite a, a difficult, on the one hand, straightforward, okay, there's a geogra there's a hierarchical sense of society and we, every society has someone on the top and then people below that. But Ranciere's arguments about equality, this is where it gets a bit slippery. So I thought I would, I would ask you, who's, who's written so much about Ranciere, to, to give us some different ways of thinking about that. Okay, great. Um... I think the first thing is to, I would just want to echo what Ranciere says about equality is incredibly slippery. Uh, it's probably one of the more difficult concepts to grasp in his writings. And I think part of that is because we have so much familiarity with other arguments for equality. And his claims which seem in some cases very straightforward. He talks about both the assumption of equality and the demonstration of equality, and they both seem pretty empirically direct. So we think we know what equality means and he's using this word. Um, I think maybe one of the ways to get at his concept and to see how it's distinct is to defamiliarize ourselves just slightly. So we might start in a totally different place with everyday conceptions of equality that we often have in modern mass regime democratic societies that go back to a liberal tradition. Uh, I don't know if you've encountered any of these authors in this module, maybe students encountered them in others. Even if they haven't read these works, I think they know these ideas where there's a fundamental um, 
starting point that is a kind of moral equality of human beings. And you see this in state of nature theories in the modern period. So Hobbes and Locke in 16th, 17th century England are both making these arguments where they say, if we want to understand human beings, we have to make up this fairy tale notion about human beings living not in society, not in history, not in traditions, but outside of all of that on some deserted island like Robinson Crusoe, and we will imagine them in this state of nature. And both Hobbes and Locke say, well, once we've constructed this scenario where humans are living like squirrels out in the wild, we will be able to say things about human beings' fundamental characteristics. And they both say they are all free, all human beings in this state of nature are free, and because they can do whatever they want, because there's no laws, no rules, no customs, no norms. And then they're all equal that a fundamental characteristic of human beings in this state of nature is that they are equal uh, for various reasons. Hobbes says quite famously that we know they're all equal because no matter what their physical and mental differences might be, even the smallest and dumbest of them is capable of picking up a big rock and dropping it on the head of the smartest and most physically strong of them. So the basic ability to kill each other makes us fundamentally equal. Uh, Locke borrows a Christian worldview and says, well, we're all equal because if we weren't equal, God would have placed us into an explicit hierarchy, that in nature, some humans would be placed above others. And so that is a shared sort of assumption that we just assume that human beings are equal in this way. And that argument for equality is connected to an argument about what society is, because those theorists go on to say that society is a contract. It's an agreement. We don't live in society, we live in nature. When we come to form a society, it's because individuals, sovereign and autonomous individuals, consent to create this society. And that social contract tradition gives us notions of limited government and representative democracy and all those things. So I think the starting point for Ranciere is that he rejects that conception of society as a contracted social order. The idea that a social order is something individuals choose to make and that society is an aggregation of individuals, he rejects that. And he comes at it from a very different perspective, which is much more historical, um, and I think simply much more accurate to our description of the world. He says, we live in social orders that are always, this is probably the most important starting point, they're always structured by inequality. They're always structured by domination. They're always structured by vertical power relations. And Ranciere calls those police orders to sort of suggest the notion that they are always structured in domination. And I think if you want to understand what Ranciere means by equality, you have to first understand that he refuses the notion that we could ever have a society that was structured simply by horizontal power relations, where we were all equal because we consented to form the society on equal grounds. He throws all that out. He says, no, look at history. That's never been the case. Societies are always structured in domination. And so if you want to make an argument for equality, but your starting point is that we live in police orders, not regimes of equal horizontal power relations, you have to make a very different argument. And so Ranciere's argument in that context is that we can't actually find equality in the essence of a human being morally. We instead find it actually eminent to that social order structured in domination that that social order depends upon vertical power relations. If you and I are, are classed differently, if you're the boss or you're the bourgeoisie and I'm the proletariat or the worker, and we have a relation fixed in our social order of domination, what Ranciere points out is that in order for the social order to sustain itself, for you to remain in your position of relative power and me to remain in my position of relative domination, I have to be able to understand you when you tell me what to do, I have to carry out your orders. And in so doing, I actually demonstrate and verify that I am your equal, despite the fact that what's being carried out is a practical inequality, that you dominate me, that you rule over me, that you tell me what to do. But in my ability to carry out your very orders, I show you what is demonstrated there to the students who are observing this relationship between us as third parties. What is demonstrated there is they recognize that actually I am your equal in that I have the same access 
to knowledge of language that you do, that we share this, what Rancière calls it, the equality of intelligence. Doesn't mean we have the same um, IQ scores. Doesn't mean we, say, we got the same marks in, in class, but it means that when it comes to our intelligence, there's no fundamental differences among us that we share this basic notion. We share a basic ability to learn. So the equality of intelligence also means that if you grab a book and I grab one off of my fake virtual bookshelf behind me, we're both capable of grasping it, of learning it. Even if I grab a book in German and I don't speak German, Rancière says, if I can just find one sentence that's a translation of what I do know in English, I can understand it. So Rancière's argument for equality is that there is embedded, eminent within police orders and kind of contrary to them, this fundamental equality of intelligence. And therefore, the, his arguments about it look totally different. Philosophers like to make these deep moral arguments as if they can prove our equality through philosophical proofs. And Rancière says, no, you can't do that. It, it can't be proved in that way. There's only two things you can do with equality. You can assume it. When you and I meet face to face or over Zoom, I can look you in the eye and say, you're, you're Paul, you're a fellow human being. I'm going to grant you the assumption of equality and therefore assume that we are equals in this way. So it can be assumed like that, or it can be verified in historical instances. We can see moments in which uh, police order structured in domination with the people on top in the upper classifications assuming that those beneath them are less than they. And there are these moments of eruptions where a logic of equality interrupts that logic of domination. So it's a completely different argument because if you say write out the proof of it, I can't do that. If you say point to the place in Rancière where he proves that we're equal, it's, it's not to be proved in that way. It can only be assumed and demonstrated. And the demonstration isn't a philosophical demonstration, it's a historical one. So that's a long, a long way around to a fairly simple answer. But I think if you try to give too short of an answer to that one is when, is when you might be led astray. Okay, that's great. And it's still complicated. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> so there's maybe two key coordinates that students who've been taught by me for a couple of years, which people, the first intended audience of this will be, they could connect it to uh, Michel Foucault and it could be connected to Althusser, Louis Althusser. So um, could you... I mean, could you clarify Rancière's position in relation to, so this, I often give students lectures about interpolation, the way in which we're interpolated by institutional hierarchies. So like when we walk into the lecture hall, this is an example I often give. When we walk into the lecture hall, the students know where to sit. They sit in the student chairs and I stand at the front. And simply because of that relation, that hierarchy that's implied in the architecture, you know that I can interpolate them as a as a as a teacher to a student, yeah. Um, and also, in in then we talk a lot of well. I've often given lectures to them on issues uh, around discipline and institutional power, and the way that it produces um, inequalities and it streams people into different different li lives and different kinds of disciplinary existence. So, can you could you relate Rancière's argument about equality? to these thinkers of, I guess they think as of inequality, they're people who go, look, this is how society hierarchizes itself. Like bodies are formed by these kind of institutions that are like factories and the relationships that we, we put ourselves or that we are put into in schools, in families, in, in relation to government, in relation to the police and so on. Yes, great. Those are that's those are excellent reference points because I think they're they're good ones to to flesh out what Rancière is up to. And I would also say the in your interpolation example, I, I give the same one all the time. I think it's uh, it's a fundamentally important one, also because as you said, it's it's institutional, which makes it physical. Uh, it makes it built into the environment. It's both bodily. Um, but also structural. So it depends on which lecture hall you're in, the relationship between the subjects interpolated as students and the subject interpreted, interpolated as professor could be different. Are they in those fixed seats where they can't move? Or is it possible we can rearrange the furniture and have them located differently? Um, are they structured in such a way that the only people they can talk to are you? that the, the student subject position can only you know, raise a hand and ask a question of the person in authority, or is it possible they can turn around and see someone else? Um, I think that 
I'll oversimplify slightly here, but I think that in a way, you can describe a lot of Rancière's most important work with Foucault and Althusser as the two most important reference. Um, Foucault as a thinker that Rancière learns from and whose work he develops. So I think that the Rancierian concept of a police order, of this notion of a society structured in domination by vertical power relations, I think that concept owes a great deal to Foucault. And Foucault is one of the few thinkers that Rancière cites in such a way as to suggest as much, that this is a thinker who's, who's come before me and some of my work is building from, from him. And we can see in some of Foucault's uh, writings an outline of these notions that Rancière theorizes in a very specific and distinct way, but he draws from that Foucault's understanding of power as not the possession of an individual, but as a set of relations that flow through discursive practices, institutional mechanisms, that Foucaultian conception of power is also an anti-liberal, anti-social contract conception of power. It refuses the notion that an individual comes first who is sovereign and autonomous and power is their possession. It says no individuals are the product of flowing power relations. And most of that, I think Rancière simply agrees with. He wants to develop it in a way that I don't think Foucault does explicitly, which is that Foucault says a lot about power, institutional mechanisms of power, subject positions and interpolation, and not a lot specifically about how we might theorize equality after we've rejected this liberal social contract model. And, and Rancière is developing that account. He's filling in an answer to the question that one might ask after reading Foucault, which is, well, how do we think equality after this? Rancière gives a very specific answer to it. It's also an answer that I think is a polemical critique of Althusser. Your students probably know that Althusser was uh, Rancière's teacher and mentor, and that like many in, in his generation, he had a significant rethinking of his theoretical and political approaches after May 68 in France, and in particular in response to what history has shown us uh, as indicted Althusser's own response in that Althusser had a more rigid structural interpretation of a social order structured in domination. That is, not only was it structured in this way, Althusser, working with certain traditional concepts of Marxism, often wrote as if he and other Marxists knew what those categories were. It's not just that there was an order of domination, but there were specific categories. And in particular, there was a category of the proletariat who was an oppressed and dominated category, but also had in a certain political Marxism, a privileged position in relationship to power where the proletariat would both witness the dominations of a capitalist society and be the key agential resource for transforming it. So when the protests break out in 68 and they're led mainly by students who are not in that category of the proletariat, Althusser was resistant and in some ways suggested, uh, this is reductive and a bit glib, but it captures the moment that you kind of picture Althusser in his university offices, looking out the window at the students at the barricades and saying, no, 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 you're the wrong agents for political transformation. And so in response to that, a number of Althusser students go in different directions. They, they mostly go away from a certain sort of uh, French Marxism of the time of the French Communist Party. So Foucault, who's also a student of Althusser and Derrida, they go in different directions. Um, Ranciere responds probably most directly. So he's one of the few people to express his break with Althusser by writing a book that is a polemical critique of Althusser. And we can look at that quickly as a way of fleshing out this conception of equality because what Ranciere is saying to Althusser is that equality and political transformation can't be predetermined and coded into these categories. The subject who expresses equality and who demonstrates equality is not a subject that we can know beforehand. We can't say, oh, it's going to be the proletariat that carries this out. In fact, the temporality of this is really crazy. It's only after a political moment occurs that we then, after the fact, look back and go, oh, that's a new political subject. That was an expression of equality. That right there, the student demonstrations, the general strike in France that followed, 
this was a moment of political transformation. And you can't understand it unless you're open to the possibility that equality will be demonstrated. And in its demonstration, these new subjects, and so this gets back to interpolation, it's not just that power relations are vertically creating subjects, it's that sometimes a subject emerges from the bottom up in resistance to power, a notion from Foucault, and you get a whole new subject. You get a whole new category of political subject that is demanding equality, that is expressing their equality. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. What, one thing that I didn't broach in my lecture on Ranciere was, because the lecture was kind of on classing, it was called Classing the Body. And one thing I didn't touch on, because I, it, it wasn't a lecture, it's not a, a lecture on Ranciere, it was on different, it's on the, the, the effects of categorization, I guess, and the fact that we class, and we, we sometimes think that, so in a Marxist tradition, the working class is actually a real organic, like specifiable referent, like, so as you just said, Althusser going, no, you're not from the working class. <laughs> don't you try and start a revolution students you're kind of in a weird indeterminate place in society it should be the working class who start and so um so that becomes a real kind of concept uh for the marxist thinker but rancière says some quite subversive things around the notion of of class he argues that you can't count all the elements of society like society isn't an organic kind of body that you can you can't empirically count and class and organize a society there's always a miscount can you explain what how that might kind of make sense to to students so there's a an attempt by social by democratic mass regimes but particularly by 20th and 21st century social science projects, where the idea would be that the social order is made up of interest groups, we usually call them, but we can call them all sorts of different kinds of groups, but there are various groupings, whether they be race, class, gender, uh, other forms of status, and the project of a social science, of a scientific sociology, is to simply count them all to empirically register them. We can think of a process of a census where you basically count every individual and not only do you count them, but you class them, as you say, you put them in some category. Oh, this person goes in this racial box, this person goes in this gender box and you add them all up. And from that social scientific basis, you therefore theorize politics as some sort of balancing conflictual forces among these pre-existing groups. Uh, there's actually a project in kind of the middle of the 20th century, a kind of centrist, conservative, democratic theory that says what politics is, is nothing other than the outcome of this balancing of forces. These thinkers, uh, empiricist pluralists, they're sometimes called, they were influenced very much by neoclassical economic models that said price and value and the supply and demand of goods, these are all products of these forces that go on all on themselves, there's this equilibrium. So in the same way that supply and demand will intersect and we'll get a price and a quantity of a commodity, they wanted to do that for politics. And so the first thing they wanted to do is have as good a data on people as they had on commodities, and then say, well, we can kind of see what's going to happen here because we know what these balance of forces will be and then public policy will just be the outcome of that. Ranciere comes at that and basically says it misunderstands the nature of politics. So to develop further, which is what I think we're doing now, Rancière's conception of equality and the way it applies to bodies, we have to also bring in one other aspect of his account, which is that he takes everything we normally define as politics, uh, parliament coming together and passing a law, an election where we choose new leaders, a judgment of a court, all of these things, he says, that's not really politics. Those things are important and we might want to demand that we have more PPE for NHS workers and even more NHS workers in hospitals in the future. And we should do that, but we shouldn't confuse those transformations of how much of certain things we have or who has more money. We shouldn't confuse that with politics. Politics for Ranciere becomes this very distinct and uncommon activity. Politics occurs when this counting that we think we've got, when it is revealed to be 
totally messed up, when there is a complete remainder that we didn't even see, when a new political subject emerges and says, wait a second, what about me? And no previous counting had occurred to, to take account of this. So Ranciere says that politics occurs through a miscount and it occurs through the revelations of a miscount in which a category that wasn't to be counted emerges as not just a category, but as a full subject, as an equal political subject. Uh, so you see this historically in cases where, for example, feminist movements, women's demands for rights, going right back to the suffrage, the idea that we lived in a democratic society, but half the population by gender simply didn't participate in that politically. And the demand for women's rights, for suffrage, and a whole host of, host of equal rights that come after that, that those movements are the mobilization and the appearance of a political subject where before we only had blinders on. Because when we think we have a full account, we cannot see outside of that. So this notion of the miscount becomes absolutely central. And what happens in the miscount for Ranciere is a political moment occurs, and that political moment is always going to be this mobilization of what he calls a logic of equality, because the police order and the normal counting operates on a logic of inequality, and a political moment operates on a, on a logic of equality that challenges that. Okay, there's a lot to be said about that, but I, I, I mean, normally at this point, right, in the discussion, so this is for the student's benefit, in, right. in, when we're talking about the, Rancière's theory of politics, you get people going, hmm, so is this politics, or is this politics? Right, right. So like now, because I want to go like, is the current discussion about the status of the NHS in the UK and nationalising health services the world over, is this a political movement? But I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there because as interesting as that is, I really am interested in looking at what you think about, you keep talking about the emergence of a new political subject. Mm -hmm. And I tend to, when that happens, I imagine one, like a person, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, because I tend to think that um, lots of disciplines, you know, so, so in economics, they would talk about homo economicus, you know, like man as economic man. And this was the, the or, or like the self-serving, rational, profit-maximizing individual. So, so classical economics of various kinds have theorized that the ideal subject of, of the economy is homo economicus, like a rational, decision-making, self-interest-serving, profit-maximizing agent. And then different, different, kind of conceptual feels like if you go Christianity they imagine a subject you imagine Christ you imagine like well, what what was Jesus like then uh, and, and 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 so on and so on and so on and so like say maybe wrong so, so Althusser imagines the political subject as the worker but not the worker the workers the the proletarian working class workers and so um I'm wondering so every time you talk about like um the emergence of a new political subject for me that's fully formed that's a fully formed like this person is idealized and looks like someone and is and uh, this person maybe is sitting behind a computer like you know like a hacktivist kind of like he's in the matrix he's like neo or something or if 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 the if the the political movement is ecological then that person has dreadlocks and they wear hemp clothing and they live in a tree and you know and and, and they kind of tie themselves to stop roads being built and so on and so on so i mean do you, do you think that um when is what Rancière is saying about the uncountable and the, the politics as a kind of a rupture of what we thought we counted and thought we'd organized, all of a sudden you turn it over and go, wow. Does that mean that Rancière says you just can't tell what the new subject looks like? You can't predict politics. You can't predict who and you can't predict what they're going to look like. But when they emerge, they're all going to look the same or they're going to look a certain way maybe? I'm, I'm really right. anthropomorphizing okay. this now, yeah. really. No, no, that's, so, I mean, the first thing I want to say is not talking about what counts as politics or doesn't count as politics is the most Rancierian move you and I could make in this dialogue, because the point is not to make politics more important than other things. Uh, right now, even though having more ventilators available and figuring out a public policy to make more ventilators available to people who need them, who are suffering from the coronavirus, uh, would not be politics for Rancière. It might, however, be the most important thing that we could do at the moment. So not 
talking about why politics, what counts as politics is important because Ranciere doesn't mean to make that distinction so as to make politics more important than anything else. He wants to make that distinction to reveal something we wouldn't see otherwise. So your question is getting at to what that important aspect of what we would reveal. I think there is fundamentally always going to be a temporal paradox. And I mean this in a really uh, literal sense. That is Einstein's special theory of relativity, temporal paradox, in that after a moment of politics has occurred, one of the results will be a political subject. And we will see it. We will grasp it. We will understand it. And we will say, well, there it is. It must have been there before. But the temporal logic of politics in Ranciere's sense is that it wasn't there before. It was occluded by the police order before such that it was rendered invisible. There was no way to see it prior to the moment of politics that made it visible. So you're exactly right that this is a model of thinking politics that absolutely refuses the possibility of prediction. It says that the last thing in the world anyone could predict is the rupture, the transformation that is a political moment. And, and politics is fundamentally these political moments, these moments in time when a logic of equality intersects and erupts a logic of inequality. It's not something that we can ascribe to an agent. So in the Althusserian or crude Marxist framework, we could say the agent of politics is the proletariat. We can identify the proletariat as workers in a certain way, and therefore we can observe and wait or inspire them to engage in politics, and politics will be what they do. Ranciere turns that around entirely. He says political subjects will be what emerges from politics. So politics as a moment or event comes first and the political subject comes after. That's a completely different temporality uh, and it's important to kind of hang on to that. So you cannot predict. I think though, after a political subject emerges, it's actually much more likely that that political subject looks nothing like our previous political subjects. Mm -hmm. And if we look historically at moments that through a Ranciere framework, we could say, oh, oh, those are moments of politics. Uh, the Athenian demos is one where the rabble, the poor, became political subjects in a way that would have been unthinkable in ancient Greek society prior to the emergence of the Athenian demos as a political subject. Uh, workers' transformations in the 19th century, where there are political moments where a logic of equality that is connected to the worker as subject occur. His example of suffrage struggles and other feminist movements. Um, one example I would give later than suffrage would be a, a mid, mid 20th century, 1960s into 1970s uh, feminist political project of rendering visible the violence of domestic abuse. The police order that existed prior to that political moment, I'll take the states as the example I know better, and there will be analogs and differences in other places, but in, in the states in the 1950s, in many US states, uh, th these laws are usually state laws, not federal laws in the USA. At that time, marital rape as a category couldn't exist. Rape was a crime, but it could not exist between husband and wife by the way the laws were written. Similarly, there was a liberal notion of privacy, of protection from the state that usually extended to the home, the domicile. And therefore in that domicile, what went on was defined by this liberal democratic police order as not politics. So when feminists mobilized in the 60s and 70s to counter and change those laws that would make the violence of a husband raping a wife right the crime that it really was and who would then also make it possible for women who were beaten to call authorities in and politicize the private household for the police to come to the door and actually enter it whereas before they would not to criminalize the violence that was spousal abuse all of those made possible a democratic political subject that was women as equal agents who before had simply been rendered in, invisible. Um, another US example is, is the civil rights movement is a, a visibility of African Americans as not just having certain rights built into the constitution, but being able to exercise them through 
the elimination of Jim Crow and segregation laws. So I actually think that most of our historical examples are such that when the new political subject emerges, it looks completely different. Uh, and not only do we recognize that subject as, oh, this is also an equal subject, but it may lead us, I think, in our best moments, we can't predict politics, but we might anticipate, and we might even think that, ah, future political subjects are probably not going to look like us, where us can be a long list of, of categories. Okay. And then I'm just, um, I'm looking at the time, and I'm, there's, there's definitely one other area that I want to talk about, which is, which is his kind of his work on educational pedagogy, teaching and learning, mm -hmm. because on a certain read, so, so Rancière wrote a book called um, The Ignorant Schoolmaster, and kind of based on a true story, and, and from it he expresses or conveys a very sort of anti-institutional, but not really anti-institutional. Uh, let's rephrase it. It, it. Rancière's approach to what I'm going to call pedagogy, but by pedagogy, I just mean teaching and learning, that relation of teaching and learning. He, does a, he, he kind of does a lot of damage to the traditional image of the teacher. And he, he, uh, his argument um, for the benefit of of students listening is uh, in that book Rancière takes up an argument of an educator called Joseph Jacotot who came to the position that you can learn without being taught and you can teach what you do not know um, and his, I could, his, his career was kind of glittering it was revolutionary and he said there is no method to this there is no method and Rancière really likes this argument because it's all about as uh, Sam Chambers was saying before about the equality of intelligence so in a traditional framework you think you go you think you go to the teacher because the teacher knows more than you and implicitly perhaps is cleverer than you and Rancière's approach is one that goes no screw that forget that the teacher's not cleverer than you the teacher knows some different stuff to you but you don't really need that figure of the teacher. I mean, could you, could you, could you talk a little bit about what Rancière does to the figure of the teacher and the figure of right. the learner? Well, I think you summarized it quite well. There was only one thing at the end that I think was an, that, that would be an important difference. And I think it has to do with the initial impact of reading Rancière's Ignorant Schoolmaster it's almost impossible the first time you encounter it not to sort of pause a few times on the way through of thinking, is he serious? He must just be making this up, right? And you kind of have to keep reading to realize, no, no, he, he's quite sincere about it. And, and I find, I, I first read this argument in, in Rancière something like 20 years ago, but for at least the last 10 years, I have internalized in some ways a lot of, about what he argues in terms of teaching and learning. So I, it's not just in my book on Rancière, I, I say you really, if you want to understand anything Rancière says in all of these other domains, aesthetics, politics, philosophy, writing, literature, you have to start with what he says about teaching and learning. But it wasn't just an argument of that book. It's important for my own pedagogy. And it, it's, it's very scary to take seriously that you can teach what you do not know because it, the first step is to sort of make the teacher seem completely superfluous. And I think in a certain sense, it is, it is saying that if you have some knowledge and you pick up some other book, you as someone who has the, you is anyone and everyone is a phrase Rancière often uses. The you is not someone's particular, it's anyone and everyone. You have the capacity to learn. All you need to learn is the knowledge of one thing which Rancière says is usually simply whatever your native language is, which you don't even need to know at any sort of high level. You don't even have to necessarily be literate. You know how to speak your own language. And from the basis of that, you learn for Rancière not by being told information, but by comparing, by starting with what you do know and comparing it to something else. And it's from there that you learn. It therefore radically undermines a lot of traditional methods of teaching and traditional institutions for teaching and learning because it points to the traditional teacher as what Rancière calls the stultifier. So the, the standard schoolmaster is the person who stands in front of the crowd of students and lectures on the thing that he is an expert in and only interacts with the students to point out to them that they do not know what he knows. And so stultification is this model in which we attempt to prove through teaching 
that we, the teachers, know more than the students and that their knowledge is always inadequate to our knowledge. This is also reflected uh, in a way that strikes home to people who I think study what you and I study, Paul, which is a lot of textual work. Um, you know, we often read text and give these texts to our students to read and traditional pedagogy says that the students read the text and then they come to class and we get in front of the class with the text ourselves and we tell them what it meant which Ranciere points out means to suggest that we are indicating to them that they couldn't understand it for themselves. And Ranciere's point is that they can perfectly well understand it for themselves. So there's a real worry of if you get rid of that, then what exactly do they need you and I for? I think there's an important place for that. And one of the things that gets missed when people are, because they're so blown away with everything else Ranciere says in The Ignorant Schoolmaster, they miss this thing he says that you don't need a relation of superior and subordinate knowledge. I don't need to know more about anything in order to teach my students stuff, but you do have to have a relation of will, Ranciere says. And this relation of will is not equal. So Ranciere's pedagogy of the equality of intelligence and the ability to teach what you don't know is not an anarchist account where anyone can pick up any book and do anything, because what the teacher does is construct the module guide, is put together the syllabus is figure out a structure of teaching and learning in which it's possible to grant this equality of intelligence. And granting the quality of intelligence, which is the first step of what an ignorant schoolmaster, a real teacher in Ranciere's sense does, is not easy. You can't just say you wanna do it. You have to, in many cases, my, I'll speak from my own experience, what thinking what this pedagogy looks like when you implement it. It means that you have to know the material in a certain sense even better so that you can pick the list of readings. You can pick the assignments and how you will interact with students on them in order to increase the chances that learning will happen. But the key here is still learning is something kind of like politics that is a happening. I cannot guarantee it. I cannot predict it. There's nothing I can do in advance that will make it so. But I do think there are things you can do in advance that will increase the likelihood of it, that will create an environment in which this sort of learning might go on. And, and you have to therefore always be creative and flexible. So for example, when you have to figure out how to shift this module in the middle of teaching it to doing so in this virtual environment, you think, well, maybe the lectures I was giving before when I can interact with students don't work very much. What if we stage a dialogical conversation with others that the students can then witness? I mean, a dialogic relationship itself is one in which the two dialogue partners ideally are granting the equality of intelligence to one another and therefore you're staging that very moment and undermining the stultification. Um, but someone, in this case you, as, as the teacher, had to figure that out, had to say, well, what is the structure in which we might best make that happen? So that final element is also crucial, I think can't be left out of, of the Ranciere approach to teaching and learning. There has to be some relation of will, and there's still a role for the teacher. It's a tricky, slipperier one, and it doesn't mean that teachers are uh, all that smarter than their students, but there's an activity and a real work there. And there's work on both sides, right? Because the notion that you can um, learn what you don't know without a teacher doesn't mean that learning is easy. You still have to do the work. And so you can create an environment for this to occur and many students might not do it. Um, the, the ignorant schoolmaster has to be okay with that. Yeah. I mean, when, when this is something that really interests me about uh, Bronx. I've always been more more interested in that book than than almost any of the other stuff that that he's he's written, and I've been interested in it because it's been it's intrigued me um, in terms of thinking about like embodied learning, like skill acquisition, right? Mm -hmm. And and you've heard me talk before. We've been at the same conferences where we've talked about. And I've I've told the story about my um i was complaining one time to my tai chi instructor like decades ago saying oh, and i cycle up this hill and i just can never get to the top of the hill i always get too exhausted and my tai chi instructor said he said well that's because you're thinking about your legs and your lungs but it's not it's actually from your belly it's from the pit of your belly that's where that's where it comes just concentrate on that and so then I did this like long bike ride again one time and I just thought it's, it's my Dantian, it's pit of the belly. That's where the, and I cycled up the hill and I was like, wow, I, I made it that time. And I, um, and I went back and saw him and I said, I did it. I, I just thought about my belly and I just, and he said, wow, can you teach me how to do that? 
<laughs> he, he just said it because it sounded like some cool stuff to say. But like, See, so he, for me, that's 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 the perfect example of this relation of will that you were still the student and your Tai Chi instructor was the teacher. And so they could give to you this. Well, think about this. And even just that focus is what led you to the work. Right. Even if, if it, I, I've heard other examples of this teaching where uh, there's some skill that someone can't pull off and the instructor says, oh, well, when you do it, just be thinking about this yeah. thing. And then they do it and it works. And they say, well, how did that work? It's like, well, just because your mind was focused in a different way. There was no trick to it. Yeah, the, the other example that, that um, comes to mind is, is when I was learning a different martial art, much more punchy, kicky martial art, and, um, and I'd be sparring with the instructor and he would never give any advice. He would just keep hitting you in the same place over and over again. <laughs> and you'd go, and as soon as you were like, oh my God, and, you, you did, and the question, because really the, he's just saying, you've, there's, there's the problem, solve it, solve that problem. And there were no words required. And this is quite common in a lot of embodied forms of learning. Like the teacher isn't going to say, well, first you need to engage your, this muscle and this posture, and then you need to do this. And then there's not, it's just like, there's, this is, this is a question. Bang. What's your answer? What's your answer? What? And it's, it's kind of like, it's a learning that goes outside of language, but not outside of structured I mean, so, so this is, I guess, part, this might be the final point when I'm looking at the, the clock. So the, one of the starting points in uh, Ron Sierre's book, The Ignorant Schoolmaster, is that Joseph Jacoteau um, can't speak French. Is it can't speak French or can't speak Flemish? He can't, can't speak Flemish. He can't speak. So he's teaching, um, he's teaching French to students who have no French. Um, and he has no Flemish, so he just there's no point of communication. And then he finds a bilingual edition of, of a book. You know those books which have like, so from in my case, English on one side and French on the other, parallel texts. And, and he just gives them copies of the book and basically just points and goes like, learn that, like learn it, memorize it, learn it, memorize it. And then over the course of time, he becomes impressed at how well they have they can construct sentences in french they can construct discourses in french by having simply learned in a very repetitive very kind of like um mimicking sort of a way um how to do this and he's astonished that that there was no method involved he just said learn it there's that that's flemish that's french learn it and i was quite taken with this idea of no formal pedagogy no formal methodology and I was quite smitten with the idea and I was asked to do a lecture in Italy, right? <laughs> I can't speak Italian, right? And I, I continue to use the present tense for that. I can't speak Italian. <laughs> um, I, might, I can order drinks in Italian, but, um, and I thought, wow, so they want me to do a lecture and it was my translator. Someone was translating my work into Italian. And I thought, well, why don't I just do, it's my words, my English language words rendered into Italian by someone who's fluent in both languages. All I need to do is study this text and I learn Italian. Man, that was the longest hour of my life. That was just hell. Watching the audience just die of boredom like this awkward, you know. So, I mean, how does that square? I mean, I followed the non-method of Ranciere. I had my intense effort of will and I came out of that more terrified of Italian than, than ever before. I mean, what, what do you make of that failed? There's a lot of people who do Ranciarian pedagogical attempts like this and say that they work, but my own intimately, painfully personal one failed spectacularly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you say? I think it goes, I, I mean, there's a, there's a line in the Ignorant Schoolmaster, it's the end of, of, of one of the chapters, where Ranciere says something to the effect of, He's laid everything out. The, the pedagogy has become more sophisticated. He's developed it. He's made some of the central arguments. And, and he's talking about the teacher-student relation. And he's talking about the student. And he says at the end that, and then in the end, the student will learn what the student learns. Nothing, maybe. I, I do think it is a pedagogical relation that is open to the possibility that just in the same way that we cannot predict politics, we cannot program our students. We cannot make learning occur. Uh, I don't have a complete explanation of why you didn't learn Italian, but my guess is that you were in a different structural relation than Jacques Teau's students who didn't know French were. 
they were driven and needed and wanted to learn French in a way that was different from you who were probably going to give the one lecture in Italian. Uh, you might have felt differently if you were taking a job in Florence oh, that required you to teach in Italian in the future. Uh, you might have felt differently if there was some body of literature only published in Italian that you really felt like you needed access to to do the current work you were doing. But in terms of giving the talk, once the talk was over, you just needed to know how to order drinks and you know how to do that. Um, so, it, you know, and the level of work to learn Italian, and then the other thing is you're going to have to continue to speak it, which you're probably not going to do where you now are. So I think it adds up to learning is hard learning like politics is maybe more rare than we might admit because if if learning is just a bunch of knowledge then there wouldn't be any even need to do it because it's all on wikipedia and the stanford encyclopedia of philosophy and google searches anyway but that actual moment of transformative learning doesn't happen all the time it requires both a good teacher and a good structure and then it requires a student who has the interest and the time and you know, today we may not have the time if someone's sick at home. Uh, the time and the willingness and a certain kind of drive because if, if, if you're not really motivated to that end of learning, nothing's going to get there automatically, it has to occur. So I actually think that, I mean, for me, that's, that's a good example of, of, of a Rancierian moment of teaching and learning, that failures are a central part of it. And I, I think we have that with examples of politics as well. It, it, it can't be guaranteed. In a, a lot of times it's not going to happen. Okay. Well, on that rather beautiful point, <laughs> on, that, on that fantastic... That's uplifting, isn't it? On that uplifting, real kind of, you know, mm, <laughs> um, moment. I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll we'll finish on that point. I'll pause, the I'll pause the recording. I'll thank the students for attending. I'll thank you. But if, if you stay on the line, Sam, and then we, we can chat. Okay. Oh, thank yep. you very much. Marvellous. Where's my recording? Thanks, everybody. End recording.